All right, High Rollers, our chat today is brought to you by Aces Wine, the best grapes in the Okanagan Valley. Now available in the U.S., www.aceswine.com, and Locals Gaming. Always play the best game in town, localsgaming.com. Folks, this is special. This guy has always been good to us, and now he's a WSOP champion. A bracelet winner took down event number one, the Casino Employees Championship, 898 runners. Let me repeat that. 898 runners, and he outlasted them all. $85,000 richer for his efforts, but I suspect with this guy, his love for the game, the bracelet means the world. Chad Holloway, senior writer at Poker News, a guy who left law school to follow his poker dream, and that dream has come true. Chad, welcome to the show, man. A heartfelt congratulations from High Roller Nation. Well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. And, you know, I think you hit it on the head when you said it was a dream come true because it uh, certainly was always a dream of mine, and it's still one of those things that I don't know if it's quite sunk in yet. It's been a couple weeks, so it's, it's really strange. Yeah, you must be wondering if you're going to wake up a dream. Eh? Hey, am I right? The eighty-five grand that's a lot of buy-ins, a little bit of security, but I know you love the history of this game, and that gold piece of jewelry, uh, what was it, Jason of Beverly Hills, that's special, isn't it? Oh, most certainly. I mean, I, I know it will sound maybe, you know, hard to believe to a lot of people, but I think the bracelet was what was most important to me. Um, you know, 85000 is certainly a nice payday, but it's not exactly life-changing money. It's not like winning the main events or, you know, the millionaire maker or something along those lines. Um, not complaining about it by any means because it's certainly going to make life a lot easier. It's going to go a long ways. But the... I'd be lying if I said the bracelet wasn't a, a huge motivation uh, when, when playing and, and something that I'll cherish forever. Absolutely. Can you describe the bracelet for us? I mean, it, it must be something to look at. Those things are nice. Yeah, it's um, it's fairly simple, but it's uh, you know elegant and beautiful in its simplicity. It uh, just says WSOP 2013 on the front. Uh, it's it's a thinner bracelet. It uh, on the back it has the the suits of the cars, the clubs, hearts, diamonds, and spades engraved in the back, and uh, you know it kind of fits nicely on the wrist. It doesn't. It's not too snug, not too tight. It it kind of jingles a little bit if you. Know, <laughs> and, uh, it's certainly very well constructed and and very you know beautiful to look at. Well, in the world of poker, that certainly is the sweetest piece of bling there is. You're there covering the series. I mean. The next day after your win, it was event number one, uh, you're working the next day, and you must have been in an enviable, uh, enviable position because you're there working for Poker News, covering the events, uh, covering guys who are trying to do basically what you have already done, win a bracelet. Did you get any comments from the players or jokes even the next day? Oh, yeah, not even, I mean, especially the next day, but even up until this day, you know, and I'm sure the rest of the series, at least once or twice a day, Somebody in some tournament will, you know, will crack a joke. Where's the bracelet? Or why aren't you wearing the bracelet? You should be wearing that. Every <laughs> or, you know, just giving their their congratulations. So it's very nice. I mean, the, literally every poker pro, you know, that I've covered over the last few years has has reached out. Some some that I didn't even realize knew my name are all of a sudden, you know, saying my name and congratulating me on the bracelet, which is surreal, you know, in and of itself. Uh, Phil Ivy is probably the biggest example I and mean, I've worked in the poker world for uh, this is my fourth world series of poker with poker news and uh, you know Ivy has never spoken to me and I've never smoked it, spoken to him you know he's hard to get for interviews and uh, but uh, during one event he you know said congratulations and you know good job and it was very simple but at the same time one of those things that you know, meant a lot to me. Oh, absolutely. I mean, oh, my God. Phil Ivey. I mean, he's the man in poker, and there he is congratulating you. I mean, uh, that's a sweet moment, man. I mean, absolutely you're going to cherish that forever. After the winner's photo, you know, they always do the nice little photo presentation with the bracelet and the cards. By the way, what were the cards? What were your holdings? Uh, Queen nine was the winning hand. Oh, nice. Okay, so after the winner's photo... Who's the first person you call? I mean, can you explain who was on your rail the night of and your family's reaction? Because it really is a family. I mean, you left law school, and your parents must have questioned that maneuver, but now it sort of makes sense to them, right? 
Sorry, uh, the, uh, the employees event is only two days long, as opposed to most WSOP events, which are three, you know, that would stop before the final table, play out that final table on the third day. Um, that gives a lot of people time to fly out, friends and family, if they so choose. I didn't really have that option. Um, had I, I probably would have, you know, had somebody come out. But, uh, you know, we started day two with 55 players, and we played to a winner. So there was really... You know, no reason for anybody to come out because we started with 55 players and the odds of winning at that point are, are still pretty small. And uh, So, the- so you, were, you were essentially all focused then. I mean, you're there alone doing your thing. It was complete concentration. Well, yeah, that's true. And I did have a lot of uh, poker friends and colleagues in the poker media especially. Um, the kind of running joke is that I've probably had the biggest rail in the media event has ever seen. <laughs> you know, two dozen of my friends and coworkers and colleagues on the rail, which was tremendous to have that support there. Um, you know, it's hard to describe. I'm just grateful that I was in seat six with my back to them. <laughs> I, to I think it would have been harder had I been facing them in seat one or, or nine. And uh, so, you know, that worked out. And, just to have them there when I won a hand cheering and if I lost a hand to, you know, give support and say hey. I mean, Chad, I hate to interrupt you, but for our listeners that never get to the World Series and they only read about it and watch it on TV, the highlight, you know, the one-hour packages on ESPN, can you explain to them, because forget about your event, you're there covering a lot of final tables, the atmosphere of that final table, it's really a spectacle, and like you say, when the rail gets involved, get a few drinks in, I mean, it's in Vegas. Vegas, right? Sometimes those final tables go late, so some of the, the rail are inebriated. What is that atmosphere like? I mean, it's a mini Penn and Teller, isn't it? Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, it's, you know, there's certainly long streaks of boredom, boredom as there often is in poker, when the cards just aren't there to drive the excitement. But, uh, you know, that's when the drinks come in handy for the rail. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's certainly fun to, to have them there. They'll get up and cheer. They'll start calling for cards, you know, when there's an all-in situation and they see what's going on. Um, you know, it certainly gets kind of, uh, you know, you're put on center stage. That's literally the main stage. And, uh, you know, when you get people on the rail, it's, uh, you know, like you're in the spotlight. And it's kind of cool that everyone's there, you know, supporting you or supporting another player at the final table, kind of different rooting sections, almost like a, a sporting match. Yeah, not many people get to experience that. So, uh, well done, sir. Well done. Who's the first person you call after everything's said and done? Uh, after I got done, you know, I got away from my friends that were there. Uh, I walked over to call my mom and my dad. Um, unfortunately, I, the the final table ended here in Vegas at around I want to say three thirty in the morning, which is about five thirty back home in Wisconsin. So it was really early. Um, didn't get answers right away. But they got called back shortly thereafter, which was nice. And, uh, of course, you know, they're very excited and, and very happy for me. They know how much poker means to me. They might not know the game very well, but they know, you know, what I do and, and how much it means to me and that the World Series of Poker is a very big deal. Um, so they were certainly happy, and we're going to have a nice little celebration party when I get back to Wisconsin at the end of July. Yeah, you know, the next day, Chad, I mean, it was going crazy on Twitter versus Josh Area puts out a nice little tweet saying the Poker News crew going to be tough to do their job today, suggesting you guys would be all hung over. Your name, your picture is shot out to the world. In terms of poker respect, I mean, you're a WSOP champion now. Have you felt any change? Uh, have people reacted to you differently? I mean, I certainly think my um, stock, if you will, in the poker media industry went up. Um, you know, uh, I'm the only one in, in that line of work, I guess, with a with a bracelet now. You got bragging rights. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, you know, it was a, certainly a moment uh, where the entire poker media came together, uh, you know, uh, putting our, you know, affiliations with various companies aside. We were there as, a, as an industry and supporting uh, you know, myself, and that was really cool to see. But, yeah, I think it definitely helped vault me a little bit as far as, you know, getting my name out there, people becoming more familiar with me, um, you know, as especially as a player in that instance. But I also think tied to that was, you know, as a poker journalist, which, uh, you know, certainly can't help 
you know, or can't hurt myself or, or poker news. Right, absolutely. Speaking of poker news, I mean, it's a lot of branding for them. Uh, did they say any thanks to you, or does it mean anything, you know, more than just uh, congratulations from them? Do you get a bonus? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about a bonus. Um, oh, I did in, in some regards. I actually did get a uh, personal email from Tony G. No kidding. Really cool. Yeah, who you know is the majority owner of, of Poker News. Uh, he was very excited for me. Very excited for, like you mentioned, the the exposure that it brought for Poker News and and for me representing the brand. Um, so that was really cool. And I know the same can be said of our editor in chief and our head head of product and you know everybody involved with Poker News was was very much excited. Right down the line, you know, listen, you know that I'm a poker junkie, too. I'm glued to these uh, WSOP live links, the final table live streams, which, by the way, folks, if you just go to our homepage, the links for those live streams are there if you want to catch out some final table action. It really is fascinating stuff. David Tuckman was talking about your victory as one of the feel-good stories of the WSOP, and he also mentioned that you were the best player at the final table. Can you sort of take us through the final table experience real quick and how everything went down? Did you have yourself in any trouble spots at times, or was it smooth sailing from the get-go? Well, I finished day one, third in chips out of 55 players, so I knew on day two I should be able to make a, a fairly deep run. Third in chips out of 900 players, you mean? No, well, yeah, you know, only 55 advanced to day two. Okay, so on day two you ended with a chip lead. Right. Okay. So, no, I, I entered day two third in chip. Okay, I got you. Sorry about that, yeah. That's right. And uh, so I knew I could make a deep run, and I did. You know, I started going deeper and deeper. But uh, it wasn't until we got to the final three tables where we moved over to where there was automatic shufflers, so hands can go a little bit faster. And I'm like, wow, this is, you know, getting kind of serious there might be a shot of making a final table here yeah did, did you get nervous by the way or did you start getting nervous by the way oh not necessarily nervous we were actually really excited and i said we because my friend josh kalick who also works for poker news as a reporter this summer was going deep as well and so there was this whole you know excitement among he and i and the people we work with that maybe we both make the final table and as you know we got deeper and deeper it seemed like that would be a reality and we got down to 12 people, and uh, it was very nerve-wracking at that moment because the blinds were so high, the stacks were so shallow, that it was almost like flipping coins to see who was going to get to the to the final table. And I was very nervous at that point, especially when Josh ended up busting in 12. Oh, man. And, uh, he, ran, he ran queens into kings. So oh. we did our, our, uh, our dream of making the final table together. But, you know, there was still two eliminations to go, so I was kind of afraid we were going to have this Gail Bauman, Elizabeth Hill, two women almost make the main event final table. But oh, that was, yeah. By the way, when your friend busts, I mean, he must be so disappointed, but I got to believe he stayed there, right, to cheer you on? He, he was certainly disappointed, and I think the worst part about it is, is that he actually had to go straight to work. Oh! <laughs> it, was, it was pretty bad, but I mean... We, uh, it was part of the deal for us playing the, the casino employees event that when we busted, we had to go to work because we were pretty short-handed. So I certainly felt bad for him, but he did make his way over uh, to watch me play at the final table. Uh, and he was there when, at the end when I won, so, so that was very, very cool. At the final table, did you feel like you were one of the better players, or if not the best player? Uh, I think uh, at first... We, you know, we started with nine, and we lost somebody straight out of the gate, I think maybe even on the first hand. And then when we were eight-handed, I made a, a very big call. Um, a guy had raised on the button. I three-bet from the small blind with ace-eight offsuit, and he ended up moving all in. And uh, it was I had, a, I had him covered, but just barely. So it was essentially... That's a big decision right there. Right, and just based upon my playing with him and my read and... I tanked for probably two minutes, and it, you know, at that point, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I, my gut tells me that I'm ahead right now, and uh, I'm going to regret it if, you know, I don't make this call. Whereas, you know, if I make it and I'm right, and I still lose, then fair enough, I, I still follow my gut. So I put in the chips. He had king jack, so I, I was right. I was ahead with my ace eight, and uh, I found an ace, and I held up, and I eliminated him in eighth place, and it was at that moment that. Uh, 
you know, I thought, okay, I think I got a chance at this. And I think another uh, guy at the final table who had, I'd been playing with all day kind of said in disbelief to no one in particular, just allowed to the table, just, wow, I didn't think he had it in him. You know why? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that for a second, Chad. Because you know, a lot of poker players find themselves in a spot like that. Uh, you know, either no matter what bubble it is, if it's the money bubble or, or the final table bubble, you know, or the final table itself, they've got a big decision for all their chips. You know, it's do or die kind of thing. Their gut tells them they're ahead, but they end up making the full. How important is it? To just go with your gut. I mean, that basically puts you ahead in the lead, gives you a chance to win the tournament right there. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think one of my strengths is is hand reading abilities, and uh, you know that doesn't do you a lot of good if you can't pull the trigger and follow through. Then trust your leads and go with them. I'm sure it's not always 100% right, but uh, you know if you fine tune it, it usually is, and that was a, a prime example. Uh, and certainly a tough spot, and it's hard to. You know, play for two days straight, knowing that that's probably your tournament as well, or, you know, your tournament life as well if you make this call and lose. But, um, you know, I learned a long time ago that you, you got to trust your gut. You've got to, you know, have this, uh, you know, you, you're going to feel worse if you don't trust your gut and then find out, you know, you would have been right or you would have won or, you know, find out this information later. And uh, so, you know, I just tend to trust my gut, and that way if, if it doesn't go my way, I can still say, hey, I, I trusted in myself. I did what I thought was right. Uh, just because the outcome you know, wasn't what I wanted doesn't mean it wasn't the right thing to do. So. so good when you see that King Jack when you make that call. Even better when you see that ace. Hey, listen, we've talked. By the way, where do you keep the bracelet? I've been just uh, you know keeping it safe. Uh, I, I won't say exactly where, but I don't wear it. <laughs> But uh, I don't leave it just sitting back at the hotel either for somebody to find. I've got some friends here in Vegas who are more than happy to, to safe keep it for me until the end. Do you, of the do you have a plan for it? Is it going to be you know in the safe forever, or do you have like a, a showcase where you might frame it kind of thing? What's your plan for that little piece of jewelry? I have a I have a little um, a little room I guess is a good way to put it where I, where I have some display cases. Uh, different memorabilia. I'm kind of a comic book geek, so I have some, you know, comic book related stuff in there. But I'll find room for it in one of these display cases and feature it prominently, where I can, you know, look at it every day, get that good feeling that comes with it, and then uh, easily get it out if I ever need to wear it or take it somewhere. Well, man, hey, congratulations again. You know, last time we talked to you, it was all about the World Series, the atmosphere, the long washroom lineups. So much better to talk about this, isn't it? Hey, while we got you, two quick questions. What is the atmosphere of the, the series like this year? Same as last year, is it better? It's, um, I think it's a little bit better. Every year they seem to, to learn from... I don't want to say their mistakes, but you know areas where they can improve. So they make these little changes, and it seems to work. So this year we've got uh, you know some more things that I've noticed. We've had like more uh, TVs and more branding in the hallways, which is kind of cool. It gives it a, a very warm and welcoming atmosphere, which I think probably goes a long way. It's really it's interesting. It's really interesting. Sorry to interrupt, but it's it's really interesting, isn't it? You talk about the branding how hard the WSOP has been pushing their online brand. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, that's a, I think that's probably the biggest thing. They have had these beautiful girls in the hallway, you know, pushing people to sign up for, for the oncoming website, which, you know, I don't know when exactly it's going to launch, but it should be here before the end of the World Series for sure. Um, but that's also giving it, you know, a very exciting feel like, okay, online poker is back. Um, I know Ultimate Gaming has already launched, and that's certainly well represented at the series as well. So to have them, and then to also have the WSOP.com coming soon, it's kind of exciting. Like, okay, you know, online poker is back. It's involved with uh, the WSOP. And, you know, add to that fact that the attendance is up about 25%. Oh, that millionaire, make, that millionaire maker was something else, wasn't it? Yeah, it certainly was. And same with the seniors event. And just every event seems to be, you know, going going up in attendance, which is really surprising and really exciting. You know, it just it's been a while. Over the years, it tends it has went down, and this year it's kind of spiking up at least halfway through. And from somebody who's worked the last four World Series, it's definitely motivating, definitely definitely exciting to see 
something special to be a part of. Well, you are in one of the best industries going, I'll tell you that. Hey, some series highlights for me. I mean, Greenstein uh, makes the final table last night, finishes third. Madisa wins. The Canadian Invasion, you know, seven bracelets now for Canucks. And might I say... A Wisconsin invasion, too, with your win and a few others. How is uh, your buddy Phil Helmuth doing? Has he uh, had any deep runs so far? I haven't really seen him you know, doing too much. He's certainly playing everything. Um, but he, he hasn't run you know, too well. He, he usually late registers every event that he plays. And so he makes a lot of day twos. But uh, he's had some early exits on day twos. And, uh, you know, with, with Helmuth, he, he tends to... You know, run pretty well at the World Series, especially over the last couple of years. Um, I think we'll see a little something out of them here in the latter half of the schedule. Do you have any uh, philosophy or explanation for uh, Canadians winning bracelets and uh, people out of Wisconsin winning bracelets? Is it the cold weather or what? <laughs> I think maybe in the case of Canada, it's maybe partly to do. They get to keep their, you know, their skill sharp by playing online. That is true, yes. You know, that certainly can't hurt. Uh, and poker is, you know, thriving in Canada. We've seen some stops spring up on the World Series of Poker Circuit, on the World Poker Tour, uh, north of the border. So that's exciting. They're getting a lot more play. Um, and certainly good players throughout Canada, um, which is being, like you said, representative of this World Series. And as far as Wisconsin is concerned, you know, I won the first bracelet. Trevor Pope won the second bracelet, and he was from Wisconsin. So that was a good start for the Wisconsin crew. And Eric Baldwin finished runner-up. Well, that was a classic heads-up battle. Oh, yeah, and I was there covering it hand-for-hand hand, all six hours of it or so. It was uh, certainly exciting between him and Matt Waxman. And lastly, Chad, before we let you go, um, can you explain, I mean, you work for Poker News. How are you qualified to be in that Casino Employees Championship? Is it anyone that works inside a casino? It's, um, you know, it's strange. I'm still trying to figure it out because this was the first year that I had learned that we were eligible. I think what allowed us to do it is that Poker News is technically contracted by the World Series of Poker during the summer, like their dealers, like their floor staff, uh, like, you know, a lot of people that come to make this happen. And uh, given that we were contracted by the WSOP and paid by Caesars Interactive, that qualified us as, you know, casino employees. Um, I think it was a mixture of that, and then also they had taken away the media event last year that, you know, was a staple at the World Series of Poker. It was nothing, it wasn't a brace on the event, it wasn't anything serious, but it was just a, a breather for, and a fun time for the media. So they took that away, and I think maybe they said, you know, I mean, it's kind of sad that we had to take that away, maybe we should let them play, you know, this media event, so, or play this uh, employees event. And, uh, so, yeah, I'm not quite sure if it's open to who it's all open to, if it was just us Poker News folks. I had actually heard just a, a few days before that we were allowed to play, and uh, that's what inspired me to get That's unbelievable. What an unbelievable story. You go to the series not even expecting to play. You get your shot, and you take it. And like you say, it's something that you will cherish forever. No one can ever take that away from you, sir, a WSOP champion. You're the first three-time guest on High Roller Radio, and you've always been good to us. i got to ask you, because I just thought of it, two weeks before the series, you organized a charity event for your friend Jesse Horkin, who needed some uh, hearing aids, $5,000 hearing aid. You organized this tournament, and she raised the money. I actually tweeted out after you won the event that, talk about karma. Is that something you believe in? Can I ask you a philosophical question? Do you believe in karma? Oh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't necessarily know if it would, uh, you know, that would be a direct uh, relation to to the win. But you know, I do like to think there's such thing as karma that there's a, you know, th that balance to the world. But uh, I'm not overly into things like that. I think it's a it's a certainly a nice concept. But uh, you know, I. I not quite sure one relates to the other, but uh, it's certainly an interesting notion. You know what, Chad? Listen, like I said, I'm a poker junkie, and I know you are. Uh, you really are living the dream now, a bracelet winner. That's something that you will have forever. High Roller Nation thanks you so much. Good luck covering the series, and we'll talk to you again sir, my man, uh, soon, my man. I actually hope maybe you'll be talking to me if I win this main event because I'm oh, that wouldn't that wouldn't that be? So By the way, I, I got to ask. Uh, you know, the main event is the pinnacle of poker, but in terms of life, 
You know, when you look at your life and all the good things that's happened, where is the bracelet rate? Is that number one? Uh, you know, I actually think it is. Just poker has been such a huge part of my life for for a very long time, and you know, I've always wanted a bracelet. It was literally a dream come true, and uh, you know, I think the bracelet. Uh, you know, physically is probably the most cherished possession that I have, but also just, you know, spiritually, uh, it means the world to me. Um, it's not, you know, a lot of people you hear lose their bracelets or yeah. find them off or give them to family members. This is going to be something that I'm going to cherish, uh, you know, for the rest of my life. And, uh, you know, hopefully something I, in the years to come, I can add a bracelet or two to go along with it. Well, absolutely, man. You know what? There's there's two types of poker players, Phil Gordon said, right? Those with bracelets, those without. You've got one. You know, you're going to join that two-bracelet club, I just feel it. Chad Holloway, thank you very much. Enjoy the series, man, and well done. Well played.